Thank you, Julie, and good morning, afternoon, and evening to colleagues from around the world. Buenos días a mis queridos amigos y amigas de América Latina. Thank also, you for good morning to my friends from Latin America. Global Protection Forum. This is our annual chance to connect as a protection community, and I'm looking forward to a lively discussion today that will set the stage for the next two weeks of engaging sessions. This year, then, is shaping the future of protection with communities at the center. Over the next two weeks, we'll explore key challenges and opportunities faced by protection clusters and practitioners in a context of rapid changes of rapid changes and in the protection environment. We'll discuss on key issues to the work of our protection clusters. And many of you who join us today from frontline responses to solutions efforts, ensuring that communities are always at the centers of our work. Over the past year, we have felt the increasing urgency of these topics, notably with the scale-up emergencies in countries like Sudan, Haiti, DRC, not to mention the Middle East and the worsening situations in Myanmar, Ethiopia, and the Sahel. We also continue to witness high levels of needs in protected crises like Yemen, Syria, and Afghanistan. These crises remind us how crucial it is for the protection community to work together, supporting community-led efforts, and to break cycles of violence. This is a situation that we understand is easier to say than to do in the context of ever-increasing conflicts and severe access to restrictions and restrictions. 75% of the protection clusters are dealing with armed conflict and violence. Today, we'll hear from colleagues in places like Afghanistan, Sudan, and Haiti. And in the coming sessions, more voices from active protection clusters operations. While facing so difficult challenges with communities and protection partners pushed to the limit of their capacity, it's motivating to see today so many colleagues committed and ready to learn and share experiences from all over the world. We have over, over 4,200 participants this year, with nearly half joining from sub-Saharan Africa. And about 10% from Latin America and the Caribbean. Our registration have become more diverse than ever before, both geographically and by type of organization. A strong sign that the forum is designed for and with colleagues and practitioners from the field. Despite all the challenges we face, we are a strong protection community, committed to be with the people we serve in the front line, committed to empower, communities and to mitigate the terrible risks that they and we face. We are together to protect. Thank you all for taking time for our of your busy schedules to be here with us today. I would like now and before we hand over to my colleague in the GPC, Lisa, for moderation of this event, I were particularly delighted to share a message from our keynote speaker, Mrs. Ruben, Mendicuela, Assistant High Commissioner for Protection in UNHCR, to offer some key reflections at the opening of this forum. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Global Protection Forum which is organized by the Global Protection Cluster in collaboration with a broad network of partners working at the forefront of protection efforts in some of the world's most challenging environments. This forum is an invaluable space for protection experts, practitioners, and stakeholders to reflect on challenges and opportunities in shaping the future of protection. Central to our discussions this year is one fundamental principle the communities we work with must be at the heart of everything we do. Their needs, their voices, and their resilience are what drives us forward and defines our work. I encourage all of you to actively participate in these discussions, and I'm particularly pleased to see that we will be hearing from partners who are delivering protection on the front lines. 
2024 has been a difficult year for the humanitarian community, as you all know, and protection and assistance have often been provided under incredibly complex and dangerous circumstances. Your insights and leadership are vital to shaping a more inclusive and sustainable protection landscape. As we open this forum, I want to take a moment for a few reflections. The UN Secretary General recently described the state of civilian protection in 2024 as, quote unquote, resoundingly grim. And sadly, I must agree. As we speak, some 62 conflicts are raging in 92 countries. Some of these have emerged recently, but others are long-standing situations. In far too many places, international law is being blatantly disregarded with devastating consequences. The toll of these conflicts is reflected in the harrowing stories of civilians caught in the crossfire of conflicts. They are killed, displaced, and deprived of their most basic rights. Attacks on humanitarian workers and a shrinking humanitarian space have compounded these challenges. Responding to a multiplicity of crises means that humanitarian capacities are being stretched. Situations with no resolution in the foreseeable future fatigue all stakeholders, including host communities, donors, humanitarians, and most importantly, the displaced themselves. The recent withdrawal of UN missions in Mali and Sudan, alongside transitions of the missions in the DRC and Somalia, have added new layers of complexity to our protection efforts, highlighting the continuing need and pressing need for adaptable community-centered approaches. All of you protection actors have shown remarkable resilience and ingenuity. You have, in you have enhanced access to conflict zones, deployed rapid response teams, and strengthened community-based networks. You have mobilized specialized protection teams to address urgent needs, ensuring flexible and agile responses to help people where they are at the most critical points of need. But there is more we must do. Protection is widely acknowledged as central to the humanitarian response. But we still face challenges in defining our operational role in specific frontline situations. Too often, in the rush to address immediate needs, protection runs the risk of being deprioritized, leading to gaps in specialized support for those who need it the most. The global goal of the Global Protection Cluster, as we all know, is simple ensure robust protection outcomes that are responsive, flexible, and centered on the needs of affected communities. UNHCR is committed to supporting these efforts and to leading, where needed, to ensure that protection is at the core of every humanitarian response. As we begin today's discussions, I would like to pose a question for us all to consider throughout this forum, but also beyond. Are we, as a protection community, doing enough to support frontline responses? This is a question for reflection as much as it is a challenge for action. We must hold ourselves accountable to those we serve, ensuring that our efforts are making a tangible difference in their lives. I wish you a very productive and useful meeting. Thank you. So oh, I think this is where I jump in. Um, thank you to everyone for joining. And I see the numbers are still increasing. They are slightly daunting figures, but it's great to have so many people here. I think as Reuven was mentioned, we are, we are talking together, but we're often talking about many of you in terms of the responses that you are running and delivering. So I'm delighted to be moderating this first discussion on frontline humanitarian responses. The fact that the focus of on frontline responses as our opening session in the Global Protection Forum highlights two things. One, it emphasizes our commitment to protection and frontline responses and first responders around the world. But I think it also points to the very humbling realities of 2024 that Pep discussed in, in his opening remarks. We have seen in contexts such as Palestine, Sudan and Haiti that the scale of violence has torn apart our response systems and has forced us to rebuild. But except as we know, we rarely start back at zero. Um, the backbone of our response is the communities that we work with, including the community of first responders and emergency responders that many of you on this call um, are part of. 
At the GPC, we admire the way in which our partners and our cluster coordination teams have risen to the challenges in new crises. Um, and we see how they've had to adapt, but this isn't straightforward. There are many dilemmas that uh, arise whenever we are dealing with emergent situations, such as how do first responders responsibly engage in humanitarian evacuations, addressing issues of continuity of protection during peacekeeping mission withdrawals that Reuven was discussing, how do we advocate for protection of civilians in the in the context of direct targeting of civilian infrastructure and civilian lives? And all within this is in the context of first responders um, and the risk that they take to be present to ensure a robust protection response and part of that, the robust protection monitoring response that informs the wider community. So today I'm joined by many colleagues across different agencies and organizations from different responses to discuss this further. So the aim of our conversation today is to do the thing that we always say that we want to do, which is just to take time to sit uh, and have a conversation together. There will be no PowerPoint presentations. Um, you will have, uh, as Julie pointed out at the start, you can chat in the box, you can add your thoughts uh, in there, but there will be eight of us joining together having a discussion and it's a hopefully it's a discussion that you draw from that you hear us saying things that resonate with you and you can share with us some new ways of thinking that we haven't thought about um so i wanted to before we get a go get going is i want to introduce you quickly who to who you're going to be spending the next hour and 10 minutes with so i have a number of colleagues that i that to to introduce to you all so my colleague arabani who works at the icrc uh, arabani has worked in the field of protection since 1995 um he's worked at icrc headquarters since 2017 first as the head of the africa protection sector and he's now head of protection of civilians with icrc Josue is currently in Haiti. He works um, in Haiti with IOM as a national protection officer. He coordinates protection activities in IDP sites and supports the border team for the provision of humanitarian response in de response to deportations from the Dominican Republic. Um, also in Haiti, I want to introduce you to Katia. She's a law graduate and specialist in population and development issues. And she's a well-known human rights activist in Haiti. And she's the coordinator of an organization called GARR, which is a support group for repatriates and refugees. Um, Valerie holds a PhD in public policy and administration focusing on IDP protection. She's worked in humanitarian protection for over 16 years in a, in a long list of countries, but I'm going to pick out uh, Iraq, Niger, Ethiopia, Pakistan, Rwanda, DRC, Haiti, Philippines. Those are just the highlights. Um, and currently she's the assistant representative protection for UNHCR in Afghanistan. And she's the person on the call who is uh, used to be a protection cluster coordinator. So I'm sure she will represent those voices. Um, we have Darren, and I really have to thank Darren because he had to step in at short notice. Darren is in Ukraine. Uh, he spent most of his life working on violence reduction and civilian protection, um, and he works along with Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, he's currently the protection advisor for NP in Ukraine. So I think, as they say, if from the frying pan into the fire, Darren's most uh, immediate work before Ukraine was leading NP programming into R4. And he was also trapped in Al-Fasher when the war began in 2023. Uh, prior to that, he worked in South Sudan. Last and certainly not least, and hopefully she's familiar to many of you, I, I'm so pleased that Shaza, the uh, founder and executive director of NADA, a women-led protection-focused organization in Sudan, um, a, a, the, the co-coordinator of the GBV subcluster in Sudan, um, is on the call with us as well. So I want to thank, thank all my colleagues in advance for their time, and I also would really like to express my appreciation to IOM for helping us co-organize today's sessions. So. Today, our colleagues will help us uh, lay out some of our dilemmas and some of, and hopefully offer some considerations on how we can improve our coordinated response. I think it goes without saying the global protection cluster is a coordination body. And so what we're always interested in is what we can do more of or do better together. Um, and it's always interesting to learn from individual organizations, but returning back to that point of togetherness, um, from that point of view, I just wanted to share some very quick observations from cluster coordination teams. 
Um, we all understand, and I think Ruben referred to this, that 2025 is going to be a very challenging year for all of us. Um, we expect to see significant decreases of funding. Um, and our cluster coordinators want to remind everybody that protection mainstreaming and centrality protection are critical common approaches, but they're not substitutes for robust operational protection responses, which are critical to realizing the ambitions of centrality of protection. And I think the reason why coordinators flag this is linked to what Ruben said, I think while we, we all agree that protection is on the front lines, or hopefully we all agree, there can be a fr persistent frustration that protection is not viewed as an emergency response. The deprioritization of protection affects not only access to funding, but access to logistics capacity, access and inclusion into staff ceilings, and puts people at greater risk by not acknowledging the um and responding to immediate protection needs. And finally, from our coordinators, and, and I, I know this is going to be a robust part of today's discussion, is we need to move beyond viewing local actors and communities as, as participants in the work that we do and acknowledge that they are the agents of change. But we also understand this is not as simple as adding more local actors into coordination systems or bringing coordination to a mo more local level. There are risks and responsibilities that are involved in supporting and harnessing this uh, uh, experience. But I think enough from me um, and over to my esteemed colleagues. I think, Arabani, we are starting with the premise that 2024 has been a difficult year and 2025 feels like it's going to be more difficult as well. So from the point of view of ICRC, you have... It, you have, in a very timely way, updated the new professional standards. So can you share with me some of your reflections that ICRC has on the overall protection situation and sort of why now for the professional standards? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone, wherever you are. Um, I'm happy to talk to you this afternoon on behalf of the ICRC. Um, I think that uh, there could not be a better introduction than the one that uh, Ruven just uh, made in order to uh, uh, underline the challenges that uh, we are facing currently uh, in the humanitarian sector. Uh, and uh, from our perspective, uh, these issues are not uh, new, not all of them. Uh, for sure, 2024 has been a very difficult year but we've seen that trend already uh, for some years uh, that are behind us. The ongoing uh, armed conflicts are causing a lot of uh, devastating uh, human suffering, displacement, death, and uh, many other issues. And um, uh, we've seen it in the field, um, the effect of uh, hybrid warfare that is being fought currently, uh, proxy warfare, protection of uh, the people not participating in conflict settings uh, has become more and more challenging, especially for those frontliners who are uh, trying to protect and deliver assistance. Um, conduct of hostilities uh, uh, has become uh, a very problematic uh, issue to deal with in um, in terms of respecting the rules, the laws that apply during conflict uh, times, uh, as Ruven underlined, uh, IHL is being disregarded, ignored, or even misinterpreted in order to fit some political agenda. Uh, more and more, we see urban warfare. Uh, the, the, the war is shifting continuously uh, toward uh, urban settings. And uh, that is exposing a higher number of civilians to harm. We see how medical facilities are attacked, destroyed, and not respected at all, yet they are protected under international humanitarian law. Um, all this is being exacerbated today by uh, new technologies of warfare. Uh, now we have uh, cyber and uh, information operations that are uh, having far-reaching consequences. We are witnessing now autonomous weapons uh, and artificial intelligence that is uh, entering in the um, war settings. And all this is creating a new kind of, uh, um, uh, new kind of challenges that uh, 
we did not see before. Um, and uh, I cannot uh, uh, finish this list of challenges without underlining how humanitarians are being now attacked uh, very often. Uh, in recent times, the numbers of humanitarian actors, frontliners who are trying to deliver, save lives and deliver assistance is becoming increasingly concerning because uh, there are many of them who are losing their lives. And on top of that, we have also uh, sanctions and um, uh, counter-terrorism regulations that are sometimes also uh, preventing humanitarians from delivering uh, their mission. And then we have all these digital risks that are part of our, our world today. And uh, all this is complicating compliance to the laws, to international laws that are governing wars. And this is a big concern that uh, led us to adapt the professional standard for protection work so that um, it is addressing these emerging challenges and so that we have a consensus around the standard so that um, practitioners have the, the common uh, kind of uh, rules, principles, ethics in order to address uh, protection issues. So the new professional standard for protection work, fourth edition, that we just finished with uh, uh, working with uh, many of the protection actors is including these challenges in there. And that's why we decided to review it at this time. I think I noticed your comment on the, on sort of digital front lines sparked a, a lot of, of comments in the box. And I, I would I would love to come back to you on, on that in a minute. But I think for the for the GPC, obviously not trying to create definitions. We know that many organizations don't necessarily use the term frontline response. You know, there's first wave response, first response, et cetera. You know, we can, but for, from our point of view, you know, we're thinking of uh, front lines are, are, it's like a shocker, an event or a scenario that separates people from safety and assistance. And so people, uh, both people and communities and service providers have to take calculations on risks in order to between safety and services and shelter and also assistance provision. Um, and I think that can make it very easy to think about it as a sort of classic frontline scenario. Uh, Reuven referred to the 75% of the locations that we work with in an active conflict. But I wanted to just say, come to you in Haiti because you you have a very interesting uh, situation in Haiti. It doesn't look like a traditional conflict and maybe it's a little bit more like the hybrid conflict that Arabani was referring to. Do you mind telling us a little more about how front lines work in Haiti and how that affects how people access services and assistance? Merci beaucoup. Bonjour tout le monde. J'espère que vous allez bien. C'est un plaisir et d'être avec well, vous. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. La situation en you know, the situation in Haiti for now is a bit complex because there are movements. Un peu coincé dans le sens que and it's a bit tough. What it means is that there are people trying to flee gangs' violence since the death of the former president in Haiti in 2021, July 2021. Violence increased and it has had a, a great impact on Haitians' lives and people are trying to just uh, flee by any means necessary uh, with their children. And sometimes they leave without any belonging, without their IDs. And we know this could be a priority. Uh, the priority could be to save your own life. And there's this movement of people who are trying to get into the country in 
Dominican Republic to find a tranquility or a peaceful life or a better life. But since most of the time this is not enough, it creates other situations for them. And according to the migration policy of the Dominican Republic, things are a little bit difficult for them. You know, Haitians uh, who are not in regular situations are deported in Haiti. And as far as Haiti is concerned, we already have this problem of gangs, problems of insecurity, problems regarding the economic situation that the population was already going through, and it increased with the gangs' violence. And for now, Haitians who are deported back in the country, who are trying to flee the country to find a better life or stability, are deported from the Dominican Republic to Haiti. And now the people who went back to Haiti, since they had to flee, the urgent community, their locality. Now they cannot return home and they are somewhere uh, locked and they cannot go into the Dominican Republic and they can no longer go back in their uh, uh, community of origin. So it's very difficult for the Haitian uh, population. It's kind, kind of difficult to manage all that. And what we can do in Haiti, we are trying to see if we can uh, manage the urgency. But here it is a circuit that is unrecognizable and uh, it's not very well handled. There are so many gaps, so many uh, difficult situations. It's very difficult over there. Back to you. Um, thank you, Sir, for that. And can I just maybe, because um, for the purposes of this conversation, or the clusters, we, we tend to work on the IDP response, but I, I think it's very interesting that you're reflecting on many countries that have, have mixed contexts. Um, but you work in with IDP sites, yeah? Um, so how does the population movement happen within Haiti? Oui, merci et pour, pour cette question. Well, thank you for this question. Est-ce que cette question a été adressée à moi ou à Katia? Uh, was it going to me or Katia, the question? Um, it's uh, to you if you don't mind. Ah, ok, merci. Bon, normalement, et, All right. et par rapport thank you. À, aux populations... You know, for the displaced moment, population, de créer, they are trying to create des, des what we call temporary shelter or sites. And it's very uh, complex for them because des, des uh, the living conditions you know, the, the, the place is not clean, and sometimes they are pressed by the gang's violence. And uh, the living conditions, is nothing is respected over there, and it's a, an enormous risk for, 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 for protection for families, as we all know. The way the sites are handled, and we know the needs they have regarding uh, access to water, access to health, and basic needs, and also the education for the kids. And it's very, very complicated. Uh, people do not have access to basic. Uh, needs. And it's true, we are trying to see how we can help, how we can support, but we all know that in this uh, type of situation, we can only see if there can be a first uh, uh, a first response. 
And sometimes we are not, we are unable to satisfy everyone. We cannot manage everything, and it makes things even uh, more complicated. There are frustration, and sometimes the population is just. Uh, Uh, unable to manage all that and control the stress, especially when they are oppressed by the gangs and also the state of service is provided uh, regarding the uh, existing services. No, thank you for that. And it, it's incredibly, it's incredibly interesting. It was in context where you have non-traditional armed groups, Arabani, you're on the call and you're going to let me know if I'm, I'm definitely not using the right phrase, but um, armed actors that are not state armed actors and, and how we deal with it. I, I'd wanted to ask Valerie a question about um, natural disaster, but Valerie, before I come to you, because Shaza is on the call. Shaza, in, in Sudan, you, you know, you, you, you obviously have um, state armed forces, you have other armed groups and Someone once referred it to me as sometimes a GBV survivor has to go through like like their own it's their own invisible front line when they're accessing services. So in in terms of the the GBV situation and and in Sudan and the front lines that are there, would you mind sharing a few of your thoughts before I ask Valerie about natural disasters? disasters. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Again, my name is Shazan Najmaddin Ahmed. I'm the executive director for Nada Al Azhar organization. Uh, Nada is a woman led organization, and we are a protection oriented organization. So, focusing only on protection uh, with special and more focus on gender based violence. Uh, during the current conflict situation in Sudan, GBV is used as a weapon. It's really creating fear uh, among people. So did you mind just a little talking a little slower for our translators? Sorry? Come again. Do you mind talking just a little tiny bit slower for the translators? I can't hear you. Can you come again? Sorry. <laughs> Do you mind talking a little slower for the translators? Okay, so I I need to talk slower, right? Yes, but we will cover all your thoughts, but just more slowly. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was just saying that uh, currently, under the current uh, situation in Sudan, uh, the GBV is used as a weapon. Uh, um, of war to create fear uh, among the population. Being that coupled with the poverty and lack of employment and livelihood, it's push boys and young youth to work in hard rich areas, in remote areas such as the gold mining areas. Uh, we have alarming number which indicate number of children and male survivors, as well as persons with disabilities among sexual GBV survivors in Sudan. I mean, sexual abuse for boys and women Uh, it's really defined as a destructive tool for community and for the tribal dignity. So it goes beyond the humanitarian or beyond the emergency uh, crisis. Most importantly, as the war exceeded a year and a half now, there are considerable number of children who are born as a result of rape, as a result of unwanted pregnancy. So simply because their mom, moms failed to obtain a court decree, which is a mandatory for abortion, and then they stay with their pregnancy and hence they have the children. Those children didn't have access to registration. Those children cannot obtain a national identification number. So automatically they will not have access to medication or to education or even to identification. So uh, we believe that now the GBV in Sudan is taking a new pattern and exceptional. And uh, I mean, we didn't see it in other countries because it's really impact women and girls as well as now we have male survivors. We have survivors, um, uh, we have uh, persons with disabilities, a high number of persons with disabilities, especially women uh, with disabilities among our, uh, our survivors in Sudan. I think, I mean, it's a, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. And it's a really alarming, you know, it's always a really alarming situation when you see, again, people have such separation from services and protection um, and adding that nuance of, of these in, very individual threats. But maybe to help us sort of close out the discussion on um, on the types of front lines we find uh, organizations are responding to, Valerie, I think it's fair to say that we're often maybe it's fair to say we're often more comfortable discussing about front lines in a mm -hmm. uh, in a conflict situation that's you know it's very often very visible um but we struggle a bit more in terms of like climate uh, climate change and and do you think that we should be including climate affected areas in how we understand uh front lines 
Thank you very much, Lisa, and good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Indeed, I agree with you that uh, when we are speaking about frontline response, oftentimes we imagine the conflict-related settings, uh, the newly accessible areas, and uh, the context about which Aribani uh, um, spoke a little earlier. However, the frontline response can have different forms, and we need to really open our minds uh, to uh, look into other settings, including natural disaster. And uh, uh, just uh, I was in Haiti after the earthquake in 2010 or the massive Pakistani uh, floods. And indeed, in those situations, uh, you have uh, people who move, internal displacement, but also severe protection risks. And uh, uh, there is acute need for protection, uh, protection response. So uh, natural disaster is a form of the front, frontline response. And in this context, uh, especially if it's a sudden onset of natural disaster, those are the communities that are the backbone of the response, that uh, are present, that absorb the shock, uh, and we need to work with them in a more structured uh, way, I believe, uh, not only on the preparedness or any warnings, but the response. And uh, you mentioned, Lisa, in the opening, uh, to make them truly an agent of ch uh, change. And here, uh, I think it's a, a good opportunity to think about the natural disasters uh, context and frontline response in that regard too. Um, we need to also reflect on uh, protection from what, right? If we speak about uh, frontline response, is it protection from violence, protection from displacement, uh, um, access to safety? All those uh, elements are interrelated, interconnected, but uh, they have also different implications. So uh, what I would say uh, with frontline responses and especially natural disasters, um, we need to be more agile. Uh, we need to be more innovative. We need to uh, really focus on the protection outcome and connect with the community so that we are effective in our response. Thank you so much. Over back to you, Lisa. No, I think uh, it's an, I realized I didn't actually come back to Arabani yet so on the digital front lines as well, because what what does agility look like in that context? But um, Arabani, my question is growing for you by the time I come back, but uh, I'd wanted to maybe call on, on Darren, um, on an NP. Um, I mean, in NP, you've gone through a couple of different frontline response models. One was sort of very international, international presence. And I, I believe in Ukraine, you work a lot more now with, with Ukrainian organizations directly. But how, you know, what when you're trying to decide what kind of approach that you're taking for a frontline response, you know, what are the sort of dilemmas and questions that you have when when deciding upon the response that Valerie is referring to and, and, and Shazo is talking about? <laughs> Thank you for the question on good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to our protection colleagues around the world. Um, Nonviolent Peace Force, when we came to Ukraine, we had to reimagine what our method or methodology of unarmed civilian protection looks like. Where was our added value? And when what we saw in the context in Ukraine was that a lot of the work traditionally done by our protection officers was being done by civilians along the 800 kilometers of the front line. So when we looked to see how could we add value to this, we started applying the same principles we applied to ourselves to volunteer organizations, looking at safety and security looking at protective equipment, making sure they had the correct type of support needed to do the jobs they were doing safely. So rather than us being at the front line ourselves, we had to reimagine how do we support. And this was one of the first contexts we've worked in whereby our presence at the front line could actually have a, a very negative effect for the civilians we were trying to protect. By having a big international presence at the front lines in Ukraine, we attract the attention of the Russian Federation. And I've been in villages within 10 kilometers of the front on patrol 
and civilians have actually questioned whether I should be there simply because they feel that when internationals come, missiles come afterwards. So we have to find that balance of responsible guardianship in our work and extend the sort of standards that we would give ourselves to the volunteers who are doing the frontline work here in Ukraine. So that's been the, the sort of shift that we've uh, had to make here. And I'll pass back to, over to you now. No, it's, a, it, it's clearly such a dilemma that our, maybe our historical assumptions of international protection by presence has really, has really changed. And so and I think it's fair to say that you know, uh, Valerie and I were talking last week and, and we we're saying like for whatever the definitions we all use, I think we can all agree that protection actors are community focused in our hearts. But how we actually support the communities, you know, it's not necessarily intuitive, right? Like you have to think of the best way. And I wanted to ask Shaza, because there are obviously risks in community approaches as well. It's not like you just say, OK, we can't do international protection by presence anymore. We'll just switch everything over to communities. Um, and when you're talking about very sensitive issues uh, in terms of, of GBV or, or issues we choose to make sensitive, maybe as well. Um, but how how do you see it? Or how do you see the balance between supporting uh, community led responses, but balancing that out with the risks of community approaches as well? Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you very much for the very important uh, point. Um, in Sudan, we as women-led organization, you know, we are the front line of protection response. And time again, uh, reports um, really pointing out that uh, we have the confidence of our beneficiaries. Uh, we have access to communities when other humanitarian can't. At the same time, we understand the culture and, you know, uh, GBV has a, a lot to do with the culture and social norms. Uh, and uh, because simply we are from the communities that we are served. So, I mean, women led organizations are often um, moved or they are displaced uh, with their communities themselves, among the communities and with the communities. And, you know, Sudan is a very vast country. It's a very big country. Uh, we have 100 tribes and we have 100 uh, ethnicities. And, and this making the GBV risk, concerns and need completely different from location to another. For instance, if we are based in, 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 a, in a capital city or in a big uh, cities and we have been moved to a, or displaced uh, to a more conservative communities, to rural areas where, sex, I mean, where sexual based violence cannot even be touched. We cannot talk about it, you know, like early marriage is very common. Uh, hundreds of girls is still undertaken uh, FGM, you know, and forced uh, marriage is as normal as drinking water in some communities. So women and girls, they cannot really um, decide or, or take a lead in their in their life. So this making the, uh, the GBV is very complicated now, and it's getting more complicated because, as I said, we move uh, and we are displaced to a more conservative communities, not only the communities, but also the authorities, the government authorities there. They are very conservative and they didn't hear before about the humanitarian context. So everything is new for them. So we, we need to respond in emergency situation like humanitarian needs. As, as, uh, at the same time, we need really to look at the root causes of the GBV and to address the root causes of the GBV. And where funds are not available, this is making, uh, and funds are only available for humanitarian response, this is making our, our response is uh, really um, difficult. And uh, I mean, um, despite that, uh, the frontline respondents and, 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 and we did a lot in Sudan, but we are facing uh, severe uh, obstacles, starting from access to funding, overwhelming with the caseload. I mean, the capacity of, of the women-led organization and local actor, uh, especially when, when using the community-based uh, approaches and working uh, directly to the community and delivering directly uh, to the affected population, uh, it's really uh, beyond our capacity. Uh, and you know, majority with, with the, one of the biggest displacement crises uh, over the globe, Sudan is facing one of the biggest uh, displacement crises with third of the population have been moved or displaced either inside the country or outside the country. So many cadres also left the country, leaving us with a very limited uh, technical uh, capacities. 
Uh, again, we're facing like suspension of our operations. Sometimes we operate in a conservative communities and either the community leaders or government authorities that are not aware about the GBV issues of most of the time we are facing suspension of our o o operation and most importantly, safety of our uh, our female. Like for Nadal Ashar, 82% of the staff is a female. Psychologists, social worker, midwives, project officers, all of them they are females, even medical doctors, people who are dealing with a focused or specialized GBV services like clinical management of rape and case management. They are themselves, they are females and they are displaced. So it's like they, they are facing the same vulnerability that our survivors uh, are facing. Uh, again, uh, women-led organization were pushed, to be honest, Bobby, by some... It, do you mind just, uh, if I, very, very quickly, just um, your fastest speaker, <laughs> Booger, um, do you mind just a little, little slower? I'm sorry, and I'm apologies. No, 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 it's, it's a really important topic. I I, 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 I understand, but uh, we want to make sure everyone hears it. Because yeah. in Sudan, we have to do everything quickly. Otherwise, the <laughs> yeah, your, your electricity, yeah. <laughs> so at least, at least we want to share what we have. I'll yeah. be as slow as I can. Uh, apologies again. So I was saying that uh, women-led organizations were pushed by some humanitarian actors uh, to really, um, to really, I mean be more engaged in human rights reporting. And you know, human rights reporting needs a specific uh, qualification and a specific capacity to do so, which I think majority of us didn't have currently. So sometimes uh, it put them at heightened risk themselves. And it, uh, as well as um, it, it's very risky for, for us as uh, humanitarian actors, as well as for our survivors and their families. And last but not least, we have limited participation as, uh, as women-led organizations. So uh, it's not very common that uh, women-led organizations are represented so our voices are heard uh, in humanitarian response and exceptionally uh, I'd like here to pause and to really uh, amplify it on the difference between the community groups and the local organization. So, because local organization and women-led organization are established uh, entities and they have like training staff while the others didn't have like training staff. And this is particularly important when it came to GBV because it's really essential to have a capacity and to know how you can function with the GBV, how you can deliver the specialized GBV uh, services. And uh, for instance, it, it's it's need like confidentiality, ensuring the humanitarian principles, because it's very good to work through and for communities and to use the community-based approach. But also when it came to GBV, we have to be careful and very careful uh, because if, it's, it, if it is implemented on the wrong way, uh, it will really hijack the operation and it could really fire back on, on the whole uh, operation affecting us as humanitarian actors, as well as uh, our beneficiaries. Thank you, over. Those are, uh, I think, the not confusing community, local organizations and community groups, not confusing them together. And I, I think it's a very important issue that you raise about also when the responders are also displaced themselves. And I think this is this is a situation that we often see. Uh, and and again, the kind of the the we're looking to conclude our session with reflecting on Reuven's question of. Are we doing enough and can we do more? But I think the question might be in some cases is are we actually going backwards? Um, you know, that 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 the in many contexts we also rely a lot on volunteer networks. And if anything, maybe we in, rely increasingly in volunteer networks. And is that a reasonable thing to to expect communities who are being displaced? Uh, to, to do within the system. But uh, Katia and Valerie, you both work um, on sort of the, the specialized legal side. And so I wanted to ask you both about maybe Katia and then Valerie, um, is how do you integrate specialized services into frontline? So Shaza, I, I think, was expressing her concern that you know, you have community approaches and community responses, but you also still need specialized GBV services, you know, that that that's also required. From from your point of view, Katia, you are you work in legal programming. How do you integrate great legal law into that programming? Maybe if if um if Katia needs a second with the connection, Valerie, I think the same. I have the same question for you about the balance of specialized services along with uh sort of like immediate community level services. Thank you, Lisa, and hopefully Katia's connection will come back um, promptly. 
Um, yes, uh, listening uh, to us and the speakers. Uh, um, I see Katia is back, Lisa. Uh, well, I didn't get the question because the, 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 the description, I didn't get it. Uh, I understood. I heard my name, but I didn't get the question. My question was around um, building on Shaz's point that we need to make sure that we have the correct balance between community approaches and specialized approaches. Uh, if I understand correctly, you work, you're uh, a human rights activist and a human rights lawyer. How do you ensure that that side is represented in frontline responses? Can someone translate for me or I can just answer? She didn't get the question. Uh, I, I think maybe just cut a, maybe what we could do is we could we could write the question. Um so you have a minute to think about it. Um if we're struggling because I'm not sure how good the connection is with your phone. I get Valerie to reply and maybe would one of the colleagues mind just writing the question to Katya? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Lisa. Uh, so I get started before um, before Katya comes uh, uh, comes in. So uh, um, from my perspective, uh, uh, we cannot um, uh, compartmentalize the protection response only to protection mainstreaming. Specialized protection services need to be um, undertaken in parallel and they feed and reinforce the protection mainstreaming and centrality of protection in frontline responses. So it's not um, mutually exclusive. On the contrary, it is, uh, uh, it is ideal if they can go hand in hand. And here I would like to stress that sometimes we hear in emergency settings, uh, uh, in frontline response, that protection is not life-saving. And uh, uh, I think <laughs> this is something uh, uh, we need to seriously look at and, uh, and uh, a contra-argument as well, because protection services are and should be at the center of the response, frontline response. And Nana spoke about the GBV services, their importance, but uh, all the protection services uh, that we are uh, providing are definitely contributing to the life-saving effort. So this is a critical element. I would say also that the protection analysis that uh, the actors do on the ground is a very important piece. Uh, the protection analysis does not serve only protection actors, but the whole system. So uh, other clusters, uh, thematic working groups, maybe the HCT, depending on the context, uh, UNCT, etc. But it's uh, really a tool for all the actors to understand the analysis, the emerging trends, uh, the new risks uh, um, that are uh, being monitored. So it's a very important piece. And for me, um, when we uh, speak about the protection interventions at the front line, it's a lot about uh, the impact. It's the impact uh, uh, of the protection outcome. We spoke about the life-saving nature. We do have a lot of tools. The how is there, the tools, the protection mainstreaming, quality uh, response, but the impact, the what uh, results uh, uh, from the from the protection uh, interventions at the front line is key, uh, and we need to demonstrate it uh, as well. So, voila, uh, over back to you, Lisa. Um, well, uh, yeah, I I think um, I, I think to any non-protection people in the call, you've heard Valerie. Um, but can I just because we're giving Katya a little more time and Arabani, I've been building my compound question on digital front lines. But to Valerie's point. Like, what is a digital frontline? And essentially, what would a digital frontline response be if we were to apply the same thinking of the points raised by Shaza and Valerie? You know, is it possible to develop a digital frontline response? Absolutely, yes, there is. Actually, um, the digital frontline is something that uh, is still 
being considered as something for the future. Um, many people around the world are considering that uh, um, war on the digital space will come to us in the years to come. It is not true. We are already right there. Because today, all the conflicts that are taking place, most of them are hybrid. It is uh, taking place in the physical world, but it's also taking place on the digital sphere. This is happening today. So we need to combine uh, our response, both on the uh, uh, physical side, on a kinetic side, and on a uh, digital sphere as well. This is, again, a reason why we decided to include a chapter in the professional standard for protection work on digital risks, because it is important that uh, protection um, practitioners are having some common uh, uh, understanding and common tools in order to respond to this, in order to, to avoid harm, and in order to serve better the communities that they are, they are, they are, uh, they are serving, but as well as well uh, to, to, to protect themselves in this, um, in this new warfare space. Because um, on the digital uh, sphere, humanitarians are as well targeted. Uh, while in the digital space, uh, there is a, a, a clear protection under the international humanitarian law of humanitarian frontliners, in the digital space, it is difficult to manage today because um, of the non-tangible nature. If we talk about cyber operations, if we talk about information operations, they can attack anyone. They can target anyone. And um, these are creating an entire new space where we need to be as well prepared to respond and to protect the people who are affected by this. Um, this is also being complicated today by technology companies, because today we have technology companies that are very powerful, that are having uh, a lot of uh, resources, and that are producing um, tools that can affect people in a big way and that are cheap to produce. They can be produced in a large scale at a cheaper price comparing to the methodology of warfare that we've been seeing for the last decade. Today, we have autonomous weapons that are controlled from a distance and that can, uh, uh, if given uh, that possibility, decide on where to launch an attack on a target. And this is removing uh, the human judgment, the human assessment before the attack. While in order to do that, we must be sure that there is a way to uh, respect the principles of IHL, of distinction, of precaution, of proportionality. All these need to be taken into account. When we are talking about cyber warfare, information uh, operations, or autonomous weapons, today we have drones that are fighting all over uh, the globe in current conflict. And these are creating new needs, new uh, uh, space for regulation and laws as well, because all these are exacerbating the situation of the people affected by the conflict, as well as affecting frontliners who are found are finding themselves in very difficult situation in order to deliver on uh, their, uh, their mandate. This is the reason why we included a new chapter in the professional standard. It is there now, and it's giving a common uh, playground for uh, the practitioners in order to respond to the humanitarian needs in the front lines. Yeah, I can see Darren nodding away. This sounds like something that probably sounds very familiar to colleagues in Ukraine as well. Um, Arbani, somebody had a very quick question. Can you explain to them what a hybrid conflict is? It is exactly what I was talking about. 
it is uh, a conflict today that we are having that is mixing the kinetic uh, physical uh, way of fighting and digital ones. These are two ways that uh, people are fighting today. They're combined. And we, we are seeing it more and more. And it's becoming very complex to navigate in this uh, complicated environment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's explore our own digital issues. Katya, do we have any luck? Are you able to hear? Just wait, could I ask you a small favor? Do you mind? Because my French is terrible. Could you ask Katya if she's able to listen on the French channel? Oui, oui. Oh, you are, you are. Great. Um, can I? Oui, oui, ça va maintenant. Ça va. Okay, perfect. Um, yes. there's, there's a few questions because Shaza, in her question or in her answer, she was reflecting on mm -hmm. the pressures put on organizations to do human rights monitoring and human rights reporting and the risks there. And, and it was interesting listening to Arabani speak about increasingly the digital influences as well. Um, and, and we see many clusters are working on misinformation, disinformation as well, that affects people's access to services, to affect their safety and understanding. Katya, in your experience as, as a human rights activist, how do you interact with these frontline the spaces? And where do you see the biggest risks in coming into 2025? Good morning, everyone. I am uh, the coordinator of GIRL. It's a group that supports the returnees and uh, uh, refugees in Haiti. Currently in Haiti, there is a wave of returnees. It means that we are welcoming a lot of returnees in Haiti. To respond to your question, I think that uh, we need a better synergy between the actors that are working at the front line between the, the returnees and uh, the humanitarian front lines. To give you a better answer to this, we need to have that synergy. We need to build that synergy so that we can better undertake our activities. That is very capital. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think speaking of building synergies, I, I think, again, it would be remiss of the GPC if we didn't we, we talk about the state of coordination and, and these, you know, are we well coordinating frontline responses and are we well equipped to coordinate frontline responses in the instances of uh, uh, what we're seeing in Haiti and Sudan in the digital space. Valerie, not to put you on the spot, but you are you are a dedicated former coordinator. I mean, do you think that the coordination space for these types of responses is improving or the same or worse? Thank you for uh, the question. Uh, oui, oui, je Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for the question. And I believe we could spend a whole evening. Uh, this is the plan. Everybody in this call has to spend the evening with us now. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so from my perspective, I would say that uh, protection in most contexts now is well understood uh, as an imperative. Uh, um, in situations of war displacements, nevertheless, uh, uh, we need to uh, dissect it a little bit and look into the scope uh, uh, of the um, protection context that we speak about. Is it uh, um, pr protection from violence, protection from displacement, protection from harm? Do we speak about prevention, addressing the root causes, uh, reducing suffering? So uh, the, the variety of contexts is very big and it's not an easy answer. Nevertheless, I think that we have now the necessary tools for the protection cluster uh, coordinators and members uh, that have evolved a lot, that has been that have been systematized, that are quite clear. 
We don't need to fight necessarily uh, on a day-to-day basis to uh, reiterate that protection should be at the center and um, beside protection mainstreaming, looking at protection, uh, um, integrative uh, programming, uh, protection dedicated initiatives and activities, uh, advocacy, etc. However, what I observe uh, nowadays that uh, um, there is often a reluctance uh, to uh, to speak up and uh, uh, to confront, uh, for example, government counterparts in sensitive uh, uh, situations to hold them accountable due to the fear of the impact it would have on our uh, operational um, activities and access. And this is something that I believe the system would uh, uh, would be more accountable going forward for the protection related responsibilities and advocacy and be more systematic uh, and really encourage uh, all of us and the leaders and the clusters uh, to to have a, a, a measured advocacy strategy and not to be afraid uh, to uh, to to use it and put it in practice. Um, for me, um, I think there are a lot of positive developments that we have seen over the past few years. Uh, and as uh, the protection grass coordinators in various countries, I could I could see those. Uh, but we need to be careful so that um, uh, we don't just pay the lip service to uh, tick the box, uh, tick the box uh, exercise that protection is mentioned in our HNRPs, in our strategic documents. But it's a genuine effort uh, to to address the protection issues and uh, uh, have positive uh, uh, impact on the protection environment and situation of displaced persons. No, oh, thank you, Valerie, and I think I, I certainly I want to ask Arabani his thoughts as well on the leadership. But before that, um, Darren, not to put you on the spot. I think the coordinators on on this call are vastly outnumbered, um, so our feelings won't be too hurt. But as a as a partner to the coordination system, you know, how do you find interacting with the coordination system in relation to conversations such as frontline responses? I mean, Valerie sort of reflect is reflecting as well on the system leadership side. Um, but from your point of view, how do you see the issue at the operational programmatic side of it? Thank you for the question. Uh, before anything, I'd really like to address Valerie's comments and say thank you very much for those comments. I feel that in recent years, the international community has lost its teeth in negotiating. When we are faced with lack of access or denial of access, we're not calling it out as a grave violation. We're not reporting it as seriously. And we saw that in Sudan with the Humanitarian Aid Commission running circles around the international community for 20 years, denying them access and everybody was quiet. And now we see the situation in Sudan. To address your question, Lisa, and thank you for your patience. Here in Ukraine, we're seeing this disconnect between the international community and the traditional coordinating uh, structures of the international community not fitting the frontline volunteer response. There's a huge disconnect between volunteer organizations in a place like Kherson, which was occupied and deoccupied and deemed too unsafe for most organizations to visit. When I was there a couple of weeks ago, I was meeting with GBV uh, actors and organizations who were incredibly frustrated with the lack of coordination coming from the international community. And they were actually angry because when international coordinating clusters and what have you do briefly visit them in Kassar, they speak for an hour about listening. And then after they've spoken for an hour about listening, they say, we have to go because of security measures. And We've seen this in several junctures around Ukraine. And I think this is where we have to make a fundamental shift and not about grassroots organizations fitting into our parameters, 
seeing how we as an international community, donors, um, all the way up to the UN and the Security Council, how do we fit the needs of the actors on the ground? Yeah. I think that has to be a fundamental shift. Thank you. I think it brings us sort of maybe back to Ruben's question of, you know, can we do, are we doing enough and can we do more? But maybe on the leadership side, um, can I ask Aravani, when, when our session today is opened up with the idea that the protection situation is resoundingly grim, what exactly then is leadership, protection leadership in that context? Um, you know, we've seen the principals came out with a statement, uh, what was it? early at the end of last week in relation to northern Gaza. Um, but what, I, I'm not sure I even have a question. I feel it's just more like a noise. Like what, what is protection leadership right now when we're facing these situations? And can it improve? Yeah. Uh, but Darren already <laughs> explained it uh, eloquently. Uh, there is a kind of general sentiment today that there is um, a leadership weakness when it comes to protection. There is, um, uh, how, how do I put it, um, leadership gap, as well as um, uh, the, the, the lack of commitment to the principle of humanitarian action and weak advocacy that uh, is taking place in order to secure the humanitarian space, in order to ensure that protection is and remains life-saving, the way Valérie was uh, uh, talking about it before. And because of this, um, as, as Darren <laughs> underlined as well, there is need of a fundamental change. From our perspective, and we can do all the work that we need to do as protection cluster, as other clusters, if this leadership is not coming back to where it's supposed to be, will be facing challenges again and again. There is need to, um, to, to, to bring back that leadership and confirming it and assert it. Um, this is why, for example, okay, we were talking about the professional standard before. Inside there, we have, include, uh, we have included a chapter on protection leadership. That needs to take place on organizational level. Each organization must be conscious of a protection leadership that they need to assume. It is also on an individual level, and it's also as well on the state level. Uh, for organizations such as ours, so it's, such as ICRC, like the UN, we get our mandate from the states. And the states must also take their leadership in order to ensure that protection means something during uh, conflict or disaster. And because of that, there is work that needs to be done. So for professional standard, we have a chapter in there that is now leading the, uh, the international community, not only the protection actors, because there we are also calling upon the contribution of donor states, because Donors, they can influence the way things are done. They can um, cancel, they can request, and they can recommend. And we think that they have a role to play there. For the ICRC, we think that the compliance of IHL is a problem today because of the loss of this leadership. And we need to revive that. Uh, for those who are uh, watching uh, the protection world Carefully, you might have noticed that the ICRC published a challenges report to IHL. That was like two months ago. And then uh, one month ago, the ICRC as well, together with China, France, Brazil, Kazakhstan, and South Africa, um, and Jordan, launched the IHL initiative. This is uh, work that will be done during two years in order to work with states, in order to look at the challenges that we are facing today in order to implement IHL. And these states will play that role of leadership in order to uh, lead the action and work with other states and other organizations in order to renew the commitment to these laws, international laws, 
that need to be respected during conflict situation or disasters. We think that this will be something important that will kind of change the course of some of the things that we are witnessing today. Back to you. Thank you. No, thank you so much for that. And I, I noticed that quite a few people are asking whether or not the professional standards are available. I think very much so. We will make sure that any of the communications after this session um, come out with, a, we'll, we'll give you a link to where you can go and, and receive that. Um, I think I, I'm conscious of Darren's point of, um, you know, talking about how we're going to listen. Uh, and I myself have done very poor time management and have the shortest amount of time left in terms of how can we do more for frontline responders. I think Shaza, Josue, Katya, we have you on this call. I mean, what is it? Darren's sort of question or point is we should be changing more to adapt to you. Um, Katya, hopefully, fingers crossed for your connection. What can we do more in this context for frontline responders? aside from funding. Funding we know for sure, but is there other things that we can be doing? Well, I was going to talk about funding because the funding is, is key, but maybe increase the funding because in our case, we receive so many important people who came back uh, uh, with empty pockets. So we need a policy for reinsertion of these people. People. They need to be reinserted in the community, and we need a lot of money to support them so they can resume economic activities. And uh, this is one thing. And the other thing is we need to increase uh, an advocacy policy in favor of these people uh, so we can have a better uh, migration policy. So much more advocacy and uh, speak against uh, bad uh, migration policy and having the funds to help reintegrate these communities. Yeah, that's it. Much more advocacy, develop further our leadership and have more funds. This is my answer. Thank you. Back to you. What is the best then? What is the best funding mechanism for human rights organizations? Katya, if I were to build on your question for funds, um, is, is there how would national organizations like mm -hmm. to see that that funding be channeled? Only through uh, proposals or projects. So if projects are relevant and projects can bring solutions to the identified problem, I think this would be the best mechanism to receive funds. We need projects, we need relevant projects that can uh, bring concrete and uh, healthy, healthy responses. Yeah, understood. And Shaza, as well, I mean, you, you obviously work a lot in your role to expand the participation of, of uh, frontline responders. How do you see it? That Are there simple steps that we can take to be better today? Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. And if I can have like a minute or two, really tell In my case, I German suggest because, uh, three minutes. You can have three minutes and then we slow it down. We're, I'm in a rush. I'll stay until you're finished. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I just want to highlight how we start our journey and how we got a chance uh, to be in the front line, not only as implementing partner, but also taking a lead in terms of uh, coordination in the country. Uh, I mean, our journey started with a grant from the Rapid Response Fund. It's one of the uh, country pool fund, which is managed by IOM. 
And then we start uh, really to build our capacity for us. That project was not only a funding uh, ch uh, channel, but also it's a technical support. So the RRF team taking us hand by hand until we uh, we finish all the project life cycle. And within that period, within the course of our partnership, we felt that the I mean our voices and our uh, our ideas and our inputs as well as our complaints uh, were really uh, well respected and considered. Like through regular consultation, discussion and meeting, our team didn't build their technical capacity in terms of implementation, but also uh, in uh, they built their capacity in terms of conflict, of confident, uh, building a confident and to take a broader role or a stronger role uh, when it came to humanitarian work in the country. And actually, this is encouraged us to really improve the quality of our work and to really uh, feel that we are strong and we jump in. So currently, Nadal Ashar is co-coordinating the GBV AO are uh, together with UNFPA as well as we co-coordinating the mine action uh, with ONMAS. So we coordinate with UNFPA and ONMAS uh, and uh, we also represent local NGOs and national NGOs within the advisory board for the Sudan Humanitarian Fund. Since our joining that uh, advisory board role, 25% uh, of the fund have been allocated uh, to national organizations, including women-led organizations. And this is automatically building the capacity of local actors and allow them to take a, a, a better uh, role and allow them to take a better opportunity in really contributing to the humanitarian work and to get more involvement. Currently, with the generous support from UNFPA, uh, Nadal Ashar is co-leading, uh, sorry, it's leading a consortium of 11 women-led organizations. So we hope by 2025, we are going to have like uh, as many uh, national organizations, as many women-led organizations that they can take a lead in the coordination mechanism inside the country. So they are not only implementing the activities, but also they are taking uh, a, a stronger role in, in terms of coordination, especially when it came uh, to the coordination of protection, which is uh, very delicate in countries like Sudan. Uh, but again, a lot needs to be done. And uh, while I'm really giving my intervention, and I hope that it will give a hope about what possible, but unfortunately, NEDA is among one of uh, a very few organizations that can point to this, I mean, to, to the success and really to reach to, to a coordination uh, forum where our voices as uh, local organization uh, is heard. Uh, but again, it's started, it's a process. It might take time, but uh, we started and we, we hope that we will continue uh, in the future. So still we have uh, a lot to be done from, from our end. Uh, over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Chaza. And I think uh, we, we were chatting you know, behind the scenes about how do we finish this session. It's actually a really hard session to finish because, as you say, it feels like it, we've started, it's a process, <laughs> and we have not in this conversation reached our conclusion. So maybe it's, uh, we still have 565 people online, so there's still a, a little bit of an appetite. Um, would any of the other colleagues, would you like any sort of final words or reflections um, before we close the session? D Darren, please jump in. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, just building on the question from before and how we would like to see things shift in terms of donor support and access for grassroots organizations like Shaza from Nadal. So I feel that I think we could start doing is the type of organizations we want to support in countries like Sudan and Ukraine. They are doing such vital emergency work. They don't have time to sit down and get grant proposals written. They are living their protection work 24 hours a day. You look at the emergency rooms in Khartoum, you look at the evacuation teams in Kharkiv in Ukraine. These people are working constantly. They haven't got time to sit down and draft a policy on safeguarding to be compliant with a donor. They haven't got time to get a grants writing person to come in and write a wonderful proposal. So if donors could start pooling funds and maybe pre-positioning and having almost a pre-release form for funding for certain materials that they know are gonna be utilized and in an emergency setting, so they can quickly release those materials. Donors could be buying materials and providing it directly to frontline organizations so they can continue their work. Kind of shift that I'm looking to see in the coming years to reshape the protection landscape. 
and I'll stop that. Thank you. No, it's a it's a really interesting. I think um, we see, you know, I think if we were we could almost have a whole conversation on the role of country based pooled funds and, and national partners and community partners, but whether or not these mechanisms again sort of fit um, and, and whether or not they are fast enough and reactive enough and supportive enough for, for national organizations as well. But I will I will suggest that to Ocha's HNP, uh, which is HNPW week. Um, but Arabani, I see you have your hand up. Yes, just to try to, to conclude as well and reply to Ruven's question, are we doing enough for the frontliners? And um, I, would, I would like to come back to, to the question of flow. Because most of the, the complications that we see in the field today is because the laws are not respected. The laws that protect frontliners exist. The laws that protect humanitarian help, assistance exist. But when they're disregarded, when they're ignored, or when they're misinterpreted, and then it creates a problem. Uh, here at the ICRC, we believe that we are living some dangerous moment that we need to uh, have collective uh, conscious and effort in order to reverse the tendencies that we are seeing in the field by making respect compliance with this international instrument as a priority for many nations so that humanitarian aid is protected, so that humanitarian frontliners are protected, are not targeted. They are not target. That's my last words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arabani. Any other colleagues have any final? I think it's hard to go any better final words than that. Just wait, please go for it. Well, thank you. I just wanted to say one last word and thank Diane and Valerie concerning what they said about coordination. You know, one of the things uh, that is very interesting regarding the coordination is the fact that we can involve more uh, the community that we are helping because we come with uh, ideas and we are so involved in the response that we cannot even listen to the people we are serving. And this is so important because we need to create a mechanism of uh, certain dialogue with the community and help them think by themselves because this is also another problem. You know, the community, they are victims, they are uh, locked up and Sometimes they don't even know what they need. So the idea in this perspective of coordination, we should push the coordinate the the community to think by themselves to see how they can be involved more in the response. And I think we would be more efficient in our responses because we all know that we are doing something but we are not doing enough and maybe there's a problem of funding but i think we need to strengthen coordination and see how we can involve the community and adjust our means and see how we can do better thank you this is what i wanted to share thank you Thank you very much for that. And I think we have then we have we sort of have our two ends of the discussion. Um, I think just way your, your very valid points as to how we involve communities in in the coordination of the response that is relevant to court to communities. But going back to Darren and Valerie's points that it's not just tick the box lick service, but it is something real for it to be real, though, we do have to address uh, Shaza's points of uh, that, that it isn't something that puts communities more at risk or puts a burden and this expectation that they do things for the system but don't get the support required. And, and Katya had flagged the kind of very practical support that organizations need. I think Aravani's very specific point, and, and I think it's it's the, the 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 point of the sort of not a target, is the the very, very real risks that frontline workers face. So that it is not it's not just a discussion we are having. It's I think to Darren your point, it's a living, breathing issue for many, many people right this second while we are having this discussion. 
Um, and we know in this really important week that we are having within the GPC or two weeks, we will also probably see many of our colleagues be be injured, have other sort of risks to their lives, to their families, um, are displaced in this period of time. And, and so that is something that I think we should all hold uh, with ourselves. So maybe there are not really any concluding words other than to say thank you so much to my colleagues for their time. Thank you to everyone who joined in. I see some concerns that we only talked about a few countries. I promise if we can find a, a whole day to talk about everyone, we would. Um, but please follow the two weeks. You will hear many of the countries that you are thinking about. Uh, Nigeria, DRC, Ethiopia, I saw them all mentioned. I'm sure they will be discussed in the other five sessions, is it, Emma? We can we can just pop in. Uh, just, I can't count to seven. I can't. I, I don't have my glasses on because the, the screen was thing, but there are more. Go find them. Um, and we will keep this conversation with the GPC rolling and also recognize that you are all having these discussions separate to us and we will follow your conversations as well. So thank you so much. And everybody have an absolutely wonderful two weeks, particularly Emma, who is responsible for the tech side. So thank you so much for Emma and Judy. And again, thank you to IOM for co-facilitating this session and helping me organize this. So everybody have a wonderful week.